And we are going to be introducing several speakers today. To begin, I'm Laura Frerichs. I'm the Executive Director of the University of Illinois Research Park, and I'm joined by Laura Blyle, the Director of External Engagement for the Research Park. And it's our pleasure to co-host this event today with a group of really wonderfully talented and inspirational women that will be talking about leading companies that have successfully been awarded SBIR grants or awards from different agencies and that are leading new companies that are in, in each of their cases able to commercialize research and technology and help to get it to the marketplace. Right here at the University of Illinois, we have an incubator program called Enterprise Works. And that incubator receives about 20 different awards to companies a year through the SBIR and STTR programs. And in its history, our companies have been awarded about $125 million in SBIR and STTR funding. So this is a topic that we're very used to. And as the two of us, the two Lauras greeting you today, I'll say that we're also big champions of female founders and helping scientists and inventors to be successful in their pursuit of new companies and also to be able to leverage the wonderful programs that are available through Small Business Administration, through the SBIR agencies that participate that help these ventures get off the ground. One of the people that's really helpful to us in getting those success stories has been Annalisa Samara, who's been around our incubator and ecosystem throughout the state of Illinois for 20 years. Um, before I introduce Annalisa, uh, Laura Blyle, do you wanna say a few words of welcome to our guests as well? Hello everyone, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us today. I see some familiar faces, some of you who've been participating in the SBIR Week in the Midwest programming, who are new potentially to our ecosystem, so that's wonderful. Um, we are uh, proud to offer this program as well as many other programs. And one of the things I just wanna emphasize is that this isn't a one and done discussion. This is uh, something that we do on a routine basis and have lots of resources for our for many of you. So if you are with, especially within the state of Illinois, we have lots of resources that might be able to assist you. So we will put some of that information in the chat. I actually dropped in my information in the chat. We do want this to be an opportunity to network with one another because we do know that uh, networking with each other and learning from one another is, is very important. So that's why we thought it was really important to bring our panel today here to help tell their stories. I've been fortunate enough to uh, have worked with, so to speak, um, all of uh, the folks on this panel in various different ways. Um, everything from exchanging ideas and coaching to um, providing them with different resources and access to different um, uh, tools that might help them on their entrepreneurial journey and have had the good fortune of watching them go through that journey. So I'm really excited to hear from them today and we'll turn it over back to you, Laura. Thanks for everyone for being here. Thanks. So as Laura mentioned, we have a lot of resources to help. And if you're in the state of Illinois, we have a new SBA FAST program, which allows us to provide SBIR and STTR assistance to entrepreneurs all across the state. So please let us know if you need assistance. Annalisa is one of those experts that helps, uh, again, go through that journey and understand how to be successful with this program. So let me tell you a little bit more about Annalisa. As I said, she's got 20 years of experience. So she's one of the best and we're so glad that she's with us today. That experience ranges from her work in biomedical research, venture capital, tech transfer, regulatory and quality management systems. She's worked on different clinical trials and she has participated in many SBIR awards, both in creation of new opportunities and working with entrepreneurs, helping them pursue them with grant applications, and then steward the, stewarding them. Some of the companies that she's worked with in particular include such companies as Diagnostic Photonics, Brightseed, American Biooptics, and now she is CEO of a new company, Rayos, which is getting a lot of attention and is a spin out of Northwestern University working on wearable flow monitoring devices. 
She holds three master's degrees, one in cellular biology from Rush, business from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and public health from the University of Illinois. And her experience, as I said, ranges from a lot of help with SBIR funding, but notably, she helps not only enterprise works here at the University of Illinois, she also works with Argonne National Labs, Polsky Exchange at the University of Chicago, Matter, and Invo at Northwestern. So in that capacity, she has really had a great chance to touch many of entrepreneurs. And across the state, she's been helping us through our Illinois University Incubator Network. So please join me in welcoming Annalisa, who will be leading our discussion today. Thanks, Annalisa. Great. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Laura. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be among such a group of really talented uh, female entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to be leading this panel today. But um, really, the, the spotlight is on uh, the women entrepreneurs. And I'd like, um, you know, for, for each and every one of you to, to get to know, uh, you know, the, the talented women uh, on the panel. So as I call your name, it'd be great if you can just, um, you know, uh, talk about yourself, briefly talk about, uh, you know, your company, uh, what you're doing, and um, any SBIR history that uh, you may have. So let's kick it off with uh, Nina. From Ansaris. Hi, uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I guess Ansaris, our focus is to develop um, AI um, tools for wastewater treatment and uh, plant optimization. And, um, you know, when we first started, um, I knew I wanted to do something with using advanced analytics in the water space. Um, and, you know, over the years, I think it's sort of honed into um, really providing this AI wastewater stack. Um, and uh, when we, again, when we first started, um, it, we, I actually incorporated the company as soon as I got an SBIR grant. So I'd say that was sort of the uh, first funded project uh, we, we received. It was through the DOD. Um, and um, it, that project just, uh, it, it aligned with what I wanted to do with the company. Um, they were looking for um, a, a solution for their mobile wastewater treatment and recycling units. And when I read the um, request for proposals, it was just one of those things that I was like, hey, that's exactly what I want to be doing. And the Army is looking for a solution in this space. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I think that sort of um, it just was a good fit, uh, you know, with regards to what they were looking to do. and. Uh, uh, when we found out we received that award, that's when I incorporated uh, as a company. That was back in um, July of 2017. Um, and so since then, um, you know, we we did this phase one uh, SBIR for the DOD, um, and uh, we were and it was a lot of fun. Um, but the, we didn't uh, get a phase two. So then we were kind of stuck where we did, you know, we did this phase one and phase two didn't come through and we were hoping that it would and that we would have the DOD as a big client. So then, you know, we changed gears and, and started to look more for commercial opportunities in the private sector. But the work that we did through the SBIR really helped, uh, number one, you know, give us an early project. Number two, uh, we developed some cool, um, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, proprietary stuff, we, we've published it, you know, it was sort of novel um, use of engineering domain knowledge and advanced analytics to achieve the objective. And that's something that I, is still unique to, you know, our approach that we, we don't just work in the data driven space, we combine um, actual engineering models with um, data driven models. And, um, that came out of the SBIR. I think that it was a great opportunity. It's all, you know, non-dilutive funding. And also the they have special rules, IP rules with the SBIR, which are quite uh, generous. So, um, you know, it was, it was great uh, to have that early project for us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I can share a few slides if that would be helpful on, on what we're doing now. Um, just uh, let me. Yeah, so, um, you know, right now the focus is, uh, as I mentioned, on um, uh, our company's focus is on, um, on uh, developing AI uh, tools for wastewater treatment plant op uh, optimization. 
Um, in the United States, uh, a lot of investment in water and wastewater infrastructure will be needed in the next 20 years. And so uh, utilities are really trying to do more for less. And uh, one of the big major expenses at any uh, utility is energy and chemical consumption. And, uh, you know, in the past, that's not been, especially energy, um, uh, has not been a big uh, top priority item to reduce energy. But now with, um, with wastewater facilities needing to sort of do more for less and wanting to be carbon neutral, wanting to be energy neutral, they're really looking at ways they can meet the regulatory requirements, which are becoming more and more stringent with lower energy um, inputs. And uh, similarly for chemicals, it's one of the highest cost operational expenses at a wastewater utility. So our focus is really to optimize these operational expenses at wastewater utilities while ensuring that they meet their regulatory requirements. And um, this is all, you know, happening while experienced operators are leaving the industry. There's been, there's a, you know, a brain drain, silver tsunami. I mean, there's all sorts of words for it, terms for it, but a lot of, um, operators are, you know, kind of approaching retirement. So a lot of that experience is leaving as these operators are leaving. Um, so our, our offering is what we call the Ensuris AI wastewater stack. And it's got, um, you know, three, um, three kind of uh, components to it. One is specking out and in, uh, uh, does, uh, in the process treatment scheme, sort of specking out where the where and what you know what kind of sensors and where they should go. That's one aspect of our offering, and we'll even offer those physical sensors to our clients. And then the analytics that should be uh, implemented to achieve the treatment plant objectives, and then providing uh, cloud-based delivery on insights for the operators. So that's our solution that we're providing to our clients, and. Um, you know, starting with the SBIR um, grant, which um, uh, came in 2017, 2018, and then doing some other kind of, I'd say first of a kind demonstration projects. We're now at a point where we have commercial clients who so are really excited. Uh, we're working on our first um, commercial deployment of this stack, um, which works um, due to coronavirus, one of our, uh, you know, big projects got delayed by six months, but we're still expecting by May of next year that it would be um, on the ground. Um, and, uh, and then we have some other commercial clients that are expected to come online later next year after the spring. So, um, you know, we're working on those commercial deployments right now. And um, uh, our focus areas are uh, uh, decentralized small community cluster systems, industrial wastewater treatment systems, and centralized municipal wastewater treatment systems. But really, uh, we've found that the biggest traction is um, for us has been greenfield projects, so brand new projects. And the more services we can offer, like um, process engineering, where we spec out the uh, sensors and provide the sensors, the more kind of services we can offer at that greenfield project stage, the easier it is to sell our analytics as a service offering. So we've sort of gone from like just providing, you know, um, a cloud-based solution with existing plants to really finding those greenfield projects where we can provide a lot of sort of, I'd say we've become a little bit more vertically integrated, providing more solutions so we can then offer our analytics as a service on top of other offerings we're providing. And that's been uh, successful for us. So um, yeah, that's, I guess that's our introduction. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Nina. I had the pleasure of meeting you a couple of years ago, and I was impressed by your technology. And, uh, and it's great that, you know, you did get that that SBIR a grant that seemed to really, uh, you know, propel things and open, you know, a lot of opportunities for you. And, uh, you know, and I, I know it op opened a lot of opportunities for the rest of our panelists here. So, you know, I, I'd like to also introduce, um, you know, the, the rest of our panel. Um, uh, Becky Fuller of uh, Bass Insight Inc. If you could just uh, maybe briefly talk about uh, your your company and, and what you're working on and uh, what uh, SBIR grant that you received. 
Sure, I'm happy to do that. And I actually did uh, pull up a, a couple slides here so I, I can uh, give some folks a, a sort of feel for what we're doing. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about, about myself, um, I, I'm, an, uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I study evolution in fish. And for uh, most of my career, I've been working on the evolution of coloration and, and color patterns and color vision uh, in fishes. And so, um, and so I tend to work on really small fish because I could get lots of them into my lab. But the major predator of this one group of fish that I work on is largemouth bass. And so the sort of story as to how we started is um, there's there's this there's a series of, of models in, in a field of science called visual ecology, where you, you can take a model and adjust it and adjust it to see how an animal with a non-human visual system would actually see something. And so I went to try to go do this to see how the bass would be seeing the fish that I work on. Um, and I just dis I discovered that there was practically nothing that was known uh, about largemouth bass. And the reason why I, I, I was flabbergasted when I found this, and the reason why is because there's a multi-billion uh, dollar industry uh, surrounding fishing largemouth bass. There's huge numbers of tournaments, you know, you know, the, yeah, people buy boats, you know, people spend all sorts of money um, going after this fish. And so what we start, uh, I had this idea to form a, a company that sort of focused on um, trying to figure out how largemouth bass see things, and in particular, how they see lures. So uh, we made this company called um, uh, Bass Insight. And if I can find my slides here. <laughs> no, that's not the one I want. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to present here. Um, yeah, so. Um, and so, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the the first problem that we I sort of uh, focused on, you know, just the fact that you go into any big sporting store and you see racks upon racks upon racks of lures and you see these people sort of standing in front of them trying to figure out uh, which one to buy. And so, you know, one of the fir early first things that we did is that we, we made uh, algorithms that allow us to sort of um, that, uh, that allow us to see what, what the fish sees. And so we made this uh, this little simulation where we could take, you know, we could take a lure, we could put it in different types of water, you know, we could put it in lake water or clear water or swamp water or green or muddy water. We could put it on a background of, you know, the background of the water column or the background against the, um, you know, of plants. We can put it at different depths and we can alter what's called the, the, the siding distance. It's the distance between the bass uh, and the lure to sort of see what it looks like. So the one on the left is how the human would see it. The one on the right is how the bass would see it. And then we, we can apply this to a bunch of different lures and see which lures are most visible and to try to get an estimate of the maximum distance at which a bass would be able to, to see something. And so this was sort of the technology that we had when we applied for um, our NSF SBIR. And so you know, what our project really um, uh, was centered around was um, also trying to um, to have ways for the anglers could actually estimate the the the, the properties of, of the light in the water body where they're fishing, and so we've been we've been yeah. So we applied for SBIR. We were awarded uh, in August of last year because of COVID. Things sort of slowed down, and so we're getting to the end of that project just now. Um, and so yeah, so we're doing two different things. So one, we're we're making these algorithms. Uh, more accurate so that in testing our, our estimates of, of sighting distances. And then we're, um, but we're also developing with a, a, a low cost a spectrometer. So anglers would be able to take this device and they'd be able to go out into the water, plunk it into the water and then estimate how well the, the light transmits um, in the given body where they are. And then they would have real time data that they can, that's actionable uh, in the exact spot where they're fishing. Um, and so we have a couple of different uh, uh, spectrometers uh, that we have been working on. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, we're we're still in the middle of our first uh, SBIR uh, phase one. I actually found it, yeah, I, I'm to the spot where I'm like, ah, phase two. And so to hear Nina talk about how things went well, even after the, her uh, her DOD SBIR got, you know, was finished, and I was like, oh, that makes me happy. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is sort of, uh, this is sort of where we are. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so we were, we originally participated in the, uh, I think Nina and I were in the same i -Corp cohort um, in the, the regional one that was here, and then uh, we uh, did the i -Corp national program, and then we eventually got an uh, uh, SBIR. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. This is a fascinating technology in such a huge market, and uh, yeah. congratulations on, 
on getting that you know NSF grant and for participating not not just one but two ICRA programs. I've gone through it myself. It is not easy. The national no. program <laughs> is not a walk in the park. You want late nights. You want uh, yeah. you want uh, you know eye bags. Do national ICRA. But you know I know yeah. at at the end of the program it's just like you just feel so much better uh, about you know things kind of come full circle and and you get a lot out of it. And I'm sure you do yeah. too. Yeah. Well, yeah. great. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit about your story. So we've heard from Nina on the DOD side on, on her success there, from, from Becky on the NSF. And then we also have representation from the National Institute of Health uh, at IH uh, with the, you know, our, our third panelist, uh, you know, from SIU, Debbie, Debbie Mukherjee. Uh, do you want to give a little introduction about yourself and uh, your company and what you're doing? Sure. So um, I literally feel like a fish out of the water. <laughs> over here because um, you guys are awesome um, whatever what all things um, AI and what a fish looks at that's amazing uh, what we are doing is something very um, not as uh, interesting as you are we just work with hearing loss and um, I've been uh, working with hearing loss particularly in humans um, for about 15 years now and what we realized um, a couple of years ago is that um, actually this happened at, uh, so what happened, I have to tell you the story. We were at i um, the nationals, and um, our technician, we were talking in the evening and the technician said, hey, this data looks really good. So I said, don't, um, don't, uh, don't uh, you know, complete the experiment, just treat the, these animals again with, um, with these drugs. And she's like, Debbie, you know that you cannot bring back hearing. I said, yes, I know. I know we cannot bring back hearing, but just, just listen to me and just do it. So this was when we were getting pho at um, Chicago and in the evening it was raining. It was, and we, I was sitting and calculating the dosages uh, with the hot food, the steaming hot food right next to me. And I didn't have enough time to sit and eat it. But that is what actually led us to where we are today. So that was just that one experiment that showed that yes, it is possible. We were at least in the human, uh, at least in the animal trials, that we were able to bring back um, hearing, uh, you know, um, for the first time. So then uh, we uh, we went through the I Corps and no, Annalisa, I have not lost those dark eye bags under my eyes. I still have them. So uh, we went through that and then um, I wanted to get uh, a, into an SBIR and um, you know, I got hold of um, Jed Taylor who I had met two years ago at SDSU and that was a, another part of NSF. So it went through, I have a lot of NSF lineage and he put me in touch with Laura uh, Bleal and uh, Laura, I met you at, um, at the i at um, for the NSF at 2018. I think we were the first cohort that they were training who, for drug development because usually NSF doesn't do uh, drug development, but somehow, somehow uh, the universe worked. So we went in, we got that, we came back. Um, I got back in touch with Laura and she put me in touch with Annalisa and uh, with her uh, with her help, it, it we were able to apply for it and actually get it um, get it in the first round because because even the NIDCD was very interested. So a little bit on if I know how to do this on um, what we are doing. Well, well, Debbie is, uh, you know, uh, sharing her screen. I will say though, she she's being modest. She's actually quite brilliant, and I had the pleasure of working with her, as as she said, and um, you know, just the ideas that she has in 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 her in her field, just like you know, really floored me. And it's been such a pleasure, and it's been so exciting to watch her, you know, progress in her research and, and you know, accelerate in her company. So, you know, she's she's really she's really a great example of a success story in this program. Um, Why you say all of that? I somehow am having a really hard time sharing my. Screen. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Did you maybe just want to uh, you know talk a little bit uh, about it if, if you're able to to show your slides? Sure. It's fine. Yeah. Um, it's just not sharing my screen. So yeah. So when we applied, um, uh, 
what, what happens in hearing loss is I'm sure that every, all of us have a parent or a grandparent who has progressive hearing loss. And we know that what, the only thing that's there is to go and get hearing aids. And a lot of older elderly parents or grandparents don't like to wear that. But what we found is that, um, you know, there is already FDA approved drugs that that can be used in just different dosages that can help in bringing this hearing back. And we got funded for this last year. Um, and uh, last year in September, September, uh, October 1st, our funding started. And because of the COVID and everything, we actually now have a um, second year. So they, uh, the NIH was very nice. They made it a multi, um, multi uh, year and a multi PI because so one of the things that we learned along the way, and Annalisa will tell you, is that we initially applied as an STTR. And because uh, the funding was pretty tight for an STTR, and I spoke to the program director, he was, bless you, Nina, uh, <laughs> the program director was very nice. He called us back and we talked about it and said, is there's anybody who can be a co co-PI with you because, uh, you know, um, co-PI with you, we, we could convert it into an SBIR. And so we were able to convert an STTR to an SBIR and add on another PI. So this PI was actually my grad student and, and she also attended the i -Corps. So she also has the lineage along with me. And so then she became the PI and the SBIR got awarded. And then she was the one who was in charge of the first year um, of, I mean, she's in charge of Novir Therapeutics and is able to get the work done and coordinate with everybody. So we are hoping uh, to apply for a phase two. And from the looks of it, that's really, really hard. <laughs> so we might have to go the other way. So. Um, I'm pretty still new, still figuring out our way, but Annalisa has been a tremendous help as has Laura, both the Lauras. And um, I don't think I could have done this without the help from Research Park and all the ladies over there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions because for some reason I can't seem to be able to share my screen. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay, Debbie. But you know, it, it is, I think you are, uh, you know, like I said, a great example of a success story. And, you know, we're so glad, you know, that you were able to get a lot of help, uh, you know, through the IUIN. And, you know, all, all of the ladies today, um, you know, are, are success stories. But what I want to do right now is actually maybe just take a, a step back. And, you know, maybe some of our, our guests, you know, uh, you know, might be excited about this program, but are at the same time might be asking, what is an SBIR? So let me just share a couple of slides and then we can get uh, you know, a little bit more granular on some of the projects that each of these companies are working on. Share it here. Okay, great. So um, the SBIR program, uh, Small Business Innovation Research or Small Business Technology Transfer, that's what the acronyms stand for, is a $2 billion a year program that provides grants and contracts to small businesses like Novira and Saras and, and, and Bats and Sites here. And it's really to fund innovative, unproven concepts and, and technologies. And, and the overall you know, all mission is to you know, support uh, the, the scientific discoveries in order to address um, American priorities and you know create jobs, create things like that in order to be, in order for us to have you know a strong economy, and um, just at a high level, this is non dilutive funding, and what that means simply is that you know this government grant funding does not take a slice of your equity pie, so that means no ownership of your company is given up in exchange, you know for for this grant funding which is great. Um, you know, I, I always tell companies that I work with that non dilutive funding can be a company's best friend. And that's one of the reasons why. Um, but, you know, as you heard from our panelists, it's, it's, not, it's not a walk in the park. It's definitely not easy. Um, and, you know, these, these grants, it's a, it's a multi-phased, um, you know, project that can, you know, bring in some significant dollars, um, you know, uh, from anywhere from uh, $80,000 to over, I've worked with companies that have gotten three or $4 million. So, you know, while it's not easy, it's, it's definitely something that um, can be very rewarding it, you know, in the end. And it's, you know, like I said, non-dilutive funding. Here's a snapshot of the different agencies that participate, um, uh, you, you know, in this SBR, STTR program. Some of our panelists have uh, been fortunate to get uh, funding here. Um, in terms of representation of 
females in this program. Um, you know, it's definitely it's increased. Um, you know, over over the past uh, you know couple of years, but you know, uh, you know, definitely I think there's uh, you know room for improvement. Uh, you know, this figure here shows that um, you know 13% of of you know, all uh, PIs between uh, 2011 and 2018 uh, were awarded SBIRs. I think, you know, the, the trend is increasing and hopefully uh, after, um, you know, the, this, uh, this panel, um, it can increase even more. And um, in terms of, uh, I guess, like agency representation, uh, you know, uh, women representatives in, in these agencies between 2011 and 2018, uh, the NSF and the DOD have been doing a really good job um, in, in that uh, there's, there's been an increase, uh, for, uh, you know, between 2011 and 2018. The NSF, for instance, went for 15.5% in 2011 to 22% in 2018. And, uh, you know, you know, there's also increases in, you know, other agencies as well. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can, you know, definitely see more representation, um, you know, in, in the years to come. So that's just kind of like a, a little background, you know, on, on SBIRs uh, for you. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, the stars of the show are really, uh, you know, our panelists here. And, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, pick their brains on like kind of just how they, you know, went through the process. So if we can kind of just take a step back and talk about awareness. So maybe, um, you know, Becky, I'll, I'll start with you. You do have like, a, you know, an academic background. How did you hear about SBIRs in the first place? Um, I knew about SBIR because when I fill out my normal grants, uh, you go through and it says, is this an SBIR award? And I was always like, no. And I knew that I knew SBIR stood for Small Business Innovation Research. And I knew there was a pile of money there, but I actually didn't know that much about it. So if you fill out your, your grant uh, application on Fastlane and you go through and there's a cover sheet, there's a thing that says, is this an, an, an SBIR? And so, yeah, I was aware of other academic researchers that had SBIRs. I didn't know any of the details like for NSF, you have to have your company um, uh, incorporated. It has to, you know, fit has to have certain properties to it. Um, but then when I got interested in that, um, you know, the the uh, the Enterprise Works had had a great big lunch series where you know they had some uh, they had people from NSF from the um, uh, uh, IIT um, or IIP uh, whatever that, that that division is, um, you know. The leaders there actually come in and talk about the program. Jed Taylor talked. I think uh, Roland Garten talked. Yeah, so all sorts of people came and talked and talked about you know how to go about applying, which was a uh, very helpful. Great, great, thank you. Now, um, you know, Debbie, I have, I have a question for you. You know, you you, you talked about how you had um, you know NSF grants in, in the past, and you know that you've gotten NIH grants, and those are you know primarily they was those were in like kind of the academic setting and. Uh, you know, when I when I talk to, to companies, uh, uh, when they're initially thinking about uh, applying for SBARs, they think, oh, okay, it might it might not be too bad since you know I apply for grants all the time. So, I guess what was what was your experience in I guess in that transition in applying for a small business grant? Was it like was it like an academic grant or was it harder? You really want me to answer that? Go for it. Because you, <laughs> you literally okay. So when I first talked to Annalisa. I was able to convince her that I had a case. I did not, this was less than four weeks before the grant was due, between six to four weeks before the grant was due. And she said, well, I think I wanted to go in. Everybody else was telling me to go for the next cycle. But when I talked to Annalisa, that was December 1st week and the deadline was January 5th. She has so much of positive energy. She's just like on my, on my own, um, energy level and she's like I think we can do it so that started it that was when and I know there's somebody uh Ro Rosalba your question was can you uh do can you apply for it yes you can yes you can do it yes you can do every it's possible I didn't register my company till December 12th I applied for the grant on January 5th yes I lost half of my hair I have a lot of big on um, you know eye bags but it is doable, you can do it under pressure. And I have three kids, so you can do it. The grant writing process is very different. And with Annalisa's help, it'll make you think in a different way. And what really helped us also was the i -Corps. It really gave us the background of what we needed. So what we went through the i was for prevention and treatment. 
what we are bringing, what we wrote the grant for was a complete like, you know, um, restoration of hearing. However, what i told, you know, taught us was the customer discovery, which was very, very important. What it taught us how to look at what is out there and how your product rates again, uh, against it. Because you have to know what your competition is out there and be able to sell the product. And once again, I will say Annalisa worked equally hard with me because I remember even on Christmas day, I was, you know, texting her, Hey, could you go through it and let me know both her and Roland because Roland was helping me with our, um, with the, uh, budget because it's, it's very different. It's a very different beast. They're all okay. So let's just say it's like, they're all horses, but they're different kinds of horses. Some will bite some won't. same way. So, um, so the grant writing process was, according to me, if I were writing an SBIR, I would put on a different hat compared to when I'm writing an R01. So um, it's, it's just different, but it's not that different into what you are presenting. Because at, at and, and I can tell you with reference to NIH, they want to see science and they want to see you know your ip they want to see that your ip is protected as well as what your um what the commercialization value is uh as far as nsf i think they are a little bit more inclined towards marketing and uh commercialization strategy the science has to be solid either ways but for nih i found that you have to really hash it out like you know they were like you have to give us the data for males versus females and you have to run separate controls for this um so those are a little, few little things that i'm sure annalisa and um uh, you know laura both the lauras and everybody can help you with but it's a little bit different not that different first time yes you will have to sit take a step back you will have to breathe you have to learn to deep breathe and that will help writing, but it is very, very doable. Your registration of the company, I did everything myself. So you don't need anybody to do anything, especially in Illinois, everything you can do by yourself. I applied for the DUNS number. I applied for the company. Uh, I applied for your SAM registration. I applied for everything. There's just like six registrations you have to do. And Annalisa sent me a link and I went and did all of them. And that was done in the second or third, second week of December. And we were able to go in for the January 5th. So it's very doable, ladies. Um, please don't hesitate. Go for it. Great, great. Yeah, I, I remember texting you uh, during the holidays and it was quite a rush, you know. And But, you know, I think, uh, you know, th that, that hard work that you really put into it and the resources that you use at the IUIN really, you know, led to, you know, great success. So, you know, uh, you know it's, it's exciting to watch you. Now, now Nina, you're our DOD representative here. And um, I know you've gotten other grants too. Um, I think I saw like you had a grant from Microsoft, some other types of funding. DOD grants contracts rather are, are definitely not easy. So I guess, how do you compare your experience in putting together you know, that application to, to other grants that, that you've gotten? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that um, with the DOD, um, I've also, uh, applied for NSF grants and I haven't gotten the NSF SBIR. I think the DOD was just, it was such a good fit with what I was thinking of doing uh, with NSERS. It was very early on in the company, as I said. I mean, for DOD, I, I applied as a sole proprietor doing business as NSERS. And then I incorporated into a corporation once I was successful and they let me change the name <laughs> on the contract. So, um, you know, I was not really even an incorporated company when I applied. Um, and um, I think the focus was really on the technology and like the team. Um, I don't think it was so much on the commercialization. I mean, they did ask for a commercialization plan, but the whole point was that they wanted to use it in their um, operations. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did say that this, uh, could have applications in other as, uh, areas as, as outside of the army. Um, but the focus of the proposal was really on the approach and how we were going to, you know, conduct the phase 
won in six months and you know who the team was and what the approach would be. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I think it's different from say the NSF uh, proposals that I've worked on where a larger portion of that was focused on the commercialization, the market and the, you know, who's the customer going to be. Um, right. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, um, you mentioned two words, so commercialization plan. I, sometimes I feel like those two words scare some academics who are writing SBRs and SCTRs for the first time. So I, I, I know you have like a strong academic background too. Did you feel comfortable in, in writing, you know, the commercialization aspects of the grant? And I guess, how did that level of difficulty compare to writing the technical portions of the grant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, with the DOD SBIR, um, I didn't find that I found the technical part portion to be where I spent most of my effort uh, in that proposal and in putting the team together. So I was just, uh, you know, one person at that point, but I knew that the team had to be more than just me. And so um, I had to find others who, you know, were willing to be part of the project if we got the funding. And I had to put that team together. I think the technical approach and the team was where I spent most of my time on the DOD SBIR. The commercialization plan was, like I said, um, I didn't focus so much on that for the DOD SBIR. Um, I just, you know, I think it was one or two paragraphs, uh, honestly. Um, I think that that was a little bit of a, um, I, you know, to be honest, a little bit, I don't know. And it was a great experience to do the DOD SBIR. But I think that in our, you know, in our mind, we were so uh, excited that, you know, maybe we would have DOD as a client that our whole company focus was on that SBIR. Our, our, our company business plan kind of started to morph into the SBIR for the DOD. And then when it didn't come through, that product that we were planning on selling, there were not really others who were interested in it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I don't know, you know, part, part of me thinks that it really was specific for the DOD, even though we said that others would be interested in it. Once we started to then pitch the idea to others, you know, that that's product, the interest was a little bit less in the real commercial, you know, space. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, we even tried to do a follow on project from the DOD for NSF. And that also didn't really, uh, and we applied to an NSF SBIR phase one. But I think that um, the DOD SBIR is really, I, I don't know, at least in my experience, like it was really meant for that, the unit that was asking for that product. And mm -hmm. in our case, um, you know, and I, I don't know if this others have had this experience, but the program manager who wrote the initial request for proposals I met her, we had a kickoff meeting. She was so excited about our product or our offering and was excited about the request for proposals. But one month into the project, she got reassigned to a different oh. division in the US mm -hmm. Army. So we had another project manager who we didn't know what he was thinking at all. Like we had progress meetings, but we didn't get a lot of feedback. And I'm not sure how excited he was about that project because I don't think he was an author on it. So. Um, I think it might even be for the DOD, you know, the project manager is really pushing it forward or not, at least in our experience, we felt that ha having the project manager leave after the first month of the project was potentially, um, you know, negative for us um, in getting phase two funding. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. No, it, it does. And I think, uh, you know, uh, communicating with the, with the program manager, you know, is important. And, you know, it's good that you, you know, you know, reached out or, you know, early on, it seemed like, you know, there, there was, uh, you know, interest in, in that. And, uh, um, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, I always encourage, uh, you know, uh, companies to do. So I guess, um, you know, in, in terms of like, uh, you know, communicating, um, you know, with the, the agency. So, uh, Becky, when, when you were uh, thinking about applying for, for the NSF, did you reach out to the NSF before you applied to see if it was a fit? 
Yeah, so, um, the, yeah, the, they have a, 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 for the NSF, they have a bunch of different people in different areas. And I, uh, when I did it, I think there was a form. I think, the, so you, you know how you write that one or two page uh, statement about your, your company. Um, uh, so I think one time we sent one of those, but uh, they also just have these things where you, so they have different, so NSF is a little bit weird because they say that they are agnostic with with respect to what the the research topic is, but then they have these different um, these different people who are in charge of different sort of areas, right? Um, and so uh, you have to sort of go through and figure out which uh, which of the program officers is responsible for the ones for the area that that you think you would be uh, going in for, um, and then I think they have a little form. Uh, where you go in and, and you put in your your info and then they get back to you on whether or not they think it's suitable or whether or not um, it would be suitable for a, for a different a different group. So there's like there's like wireless technology and there's educational stuff and you know yeah yeah there's there's all sorts of different um, groups there yeah. Yeah, and so that's and that's probably a good way. You know, if somebody says no, don't apply, right? Then it's probably worth finding a different. A, a, at least a different area, right? Um, yeah, so, so that you're not wasting your time sort of going towards that one person who's not really jazzed on what your project is, so. Sure, sure, yeah, the, the NSF does have, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of broad interest, but in, in, you know, very specific areas, I think 12 or 13, you know, different research topics. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that your company found a home there. So uh, I guess uh, another question for you, Becky, is, is that when you were putting together an application, and I get this asked a lot by, by academics, mm -hmm. um, did you have preliminary data um, that you put into your application? Because it's not required, but I know that it's something that reviewers like to see. Yeah, you you know that figure I just showed you that that goes into almost every single one of my grants because otherwise I find if I don't give them some sort of idea as to what we're doing and what we can do, they're like, "What the fish sees it differently and it differs with a depth and it differs with a this and with a that." Like we have to find some way of like visually showing you know, showing the, the person what we can and can't do. So, so we, in our case, we, we weren't giving them our algorithms, but we were showing them what our algorithms could do. Right. So, mm -hmm. all right. So we've developed the stuff to this point, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I think they want to see that. Yeah. It's not just, Hey, I have an idea. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's, it has to be a little bit more than that. Right. Sure. Sure. Agreed. Now, now, Debbie, over at the NIH, do you, did you feel that the same way that uh, they kind of wanted a little bit more than an idea? So, you know, I guess how much preliminary data did you provide? So, yeah, uh, we had, um, we actually, by the time we, uh, we sent it in, we had enough preliminary data to convince them. But yes, it, we, it did require, um, it wasn't just an idea we had solid data. I'm not saying I had like an N of 100, but I at least had, you know, it was repeatable. And we could show that um, we had a, you know, you have to have a good solid data set to convince them. Um, I'm not sure if just an idea will fly with at the NIH, but they, if you can come in with some, uh, with some, you know, just like basic confirmatory tests that, uh, all of our institutes have something called, uh, you know, re concept developments. And so if you reach out to you, the other person I would uh, say is reach out to your technology transfer office also, and they can also help direct you to a research park and they will be able to, uh, you know, put you in touch. Uh, so they will also tell you that you do need more data. So I was at a point where we had enough data to file for a patent. You know, so yes, it do, you do require some solid ba background data that yes, this will work. Yes, it's commercializable. Yes, you can, you can translate this from an animal model to a human model. And for us, that was easier because these drugs already are FDA approved. We are just combining them and using them in different dosages and, and um, you know, and, and di in different frequencies. So it was, um, I think for us, uh, that really helped a lot. What do you think, Annalisa? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, you got the grant, right? So, uh, you know, that, that and, and I think you definitely have potential for, you know, for, for future grants. Um, you know, 
you know, while these grants are, you know, fantastic and, you know, phase one, it can, you know, provide, you know, over $200,000, you know, sometimes more, um, you know, it, it's just kind of like a, a piece of the, the full kind of funding path, right? So I know that companies have to seek a, a additional funding. So, so Nina, I guess in, in, in your experience, you know, you got, you got the DOD grant, you got a couple other grants, I guess, how do you, how did you, how are you piecing things together? Are you, are you seeking dilute funding as well or applying for more grants or both? Um, at this point, we're not seeking um, a VC funding, nor are we applying for more grants. We're just working on commercial projects. And so, you know, I think that the early funding I got really helped sort of, um, I'd say, um, you know, a, allowing us to do some cool stuff for, you know, and get paid for it. Um, you know, the, the concept of using AI for wastewater optimization, when I first started Enceris was a very niche area that, a new area that nobody was really talking about. And I remember going to wastewater treatment facilities and making presentations. And I think it was just, you know, going, you know, it wasn't really sinking in. Now it's the new hot thing. <laughs> like now everyone, every conference I go to, it's like, oh, intelligent water systems are the wave of the future. And, and so now people are open to commercial projects uh, more so than they were before. I mean, it's not like there's, um, I'd still say it's a pretty new space in, in my field, but there are RFPs that, you know, you find utilities releasing. There's private clients who want to incorporate it. And so, you know, um, I never, after getting the early grants that were non-dilutive, um, I never really, uh, you know, I guess I have thought about getting more funding because I think I would grow faster if I did. But I haven't gone that route yet. And not saying that I won't in the future, I don't know right now, but right now I'm pretty busy and pretty excited with just that we have some commercial projects that are ready to, you know, that we're working on right now. And, um, and I, I may seek other, uh, you know, I know that I would probably grow, grow faster if I got other kinds of funding. So that's a decision I have to at some point make, you know, the rate of growth, what's, what, what do I want for my company? Yeah, so. definitely. It, it sounds like that you're, um, uh, you know, while you're not uh, currently, uh, you know, uh, looking or actively applying for grants, you know, and contracts, you are aware of them. And I think awareness is important to you. So how do you even find out about these opportunities? You said RFP, do you, do you just look on the DOD website or wh where do you find your sources to look at future funding? Yeah, um, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, there's uh, different uh, utility portals where you can go to see what RFPs have been released by them. There's, and that's more of the public kind of clients, but there are a lot of those. And, you know, with a small company, how do you kind of keep track of all of it? Um, like uh, I'm applying to a, a project, you know, proposal right now, which is just, just exactly what we do. And I wouldn't have even found out about it if I, uh, a colleague hadn't called me and told me about it. So, I mean, now I'm a, uh, we're applying and we're a finalist for that project, but I wouldn't have found out if it wasn't for a colleague. So I don't know, you know, you can't, I don't know with one, I don't know if I have a good uh, answer for how to systematically do it. Um, I think the, the public RFP, there's some websites that one can follow, but you know, these projects, especially AI and, and wastewater, it's not gonna be like the most common thing uh, that you see. The other uh, approach that, uh, I'm taking is, I mentioned offering more services and sort of, um, you, you know, prior to starting Enceris, I was a wastewater process engineer and I designed wastewater treatment plants. So going to facilities that are looking for new wastewater treatment plants and saying, well, you know, I can provide design services for you and provide sensors, automation and analytics as a service. That's been approach that I've been uh, finding success with as well. Excellent. Great, great. 
And I think, uh, you know, we have uh, probably about, you know, five minutes of you know, more to the hour. And, um, you know, I think it would be, and hopefully, you know, some, some women here, uh, attendees are, you know, are, are inspired and encouraged to, you know, apply for SBIR. So, you know, it'd be great if, um, you know, each of our panelists can, can provide some, I guess, uh, you know, some, some tips um, and, uh, you know, I guess uh, just share some knowledge, um, you know, to s some of these, you know, f future applicants. So, you know, starting uh, with you, Becky, I guess, any, any tips you, you want to share just kind of based on your journey? Yeah. Uh, one, I would say as, as much as i was a pain, uh, it, w it was worth it. Uh, yeah. So we gained a lot of knowledge out of doing it. I, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not easy, right? And they don't make it easy. <laughs> but I, I would, I would definitely do I Corps. Just you know, if you're especially if you're going to go the NSF route, because with the NSF proposal, you know, they're asking for you know your commercialization plan and this and that and the other. That's it's not on the not on the project side, but on the how are you going to sell this side, right? The other thing I'd say, and this is you know for any grant. Um, you know, get the instructions and follow the instructions to the T. For the SBIR, um, I found it amazingly helpful that they had this uh, in the instruction. They actually told you, you know, this phase, this part of the grant should be one page. This part should be, you know, two, two to three pages. This part should be this many. You should address these questions. Like, yeah, so it was the most sort of like, here is what we want you to tell us. And then, you know, our job was sort of to try to, you know, satisfactorily answer all those questions in a way that got them satisfied right so um yeah so go and find the instructions yeah with all the the bullet points that you need to hit and yeah do that to the best of your ability great thanks becky now now debbie you hit a home run on your first try so i guess what which is fantastic and not surprising but what what advice do you have for for some of these uh prospective applicants Okay, so this is what I would say would help if I were talking to myself two years for, you know, a younger version of myself. So I would completely agree with Becky, the i really helped. Uh, pay attention to all the questions and all the instructions. However, before you do anything, talk to your tech transfer. Even if they don't want to apply or you don't have enough for a patent, they can at least do, um, what do you call it, Annalisa? The, the, the I'm sorry? Provisional? Provisional? Yeah. Is that provisional what patent. And you know, if they don't want to do it and you want to do it, it only costs about, it actually costs $75. And if you can find, uh, you know, uh, another person who can uh, apply it for you, just go ahead and do that. Get that provisional patent. It is very important. Okay, if you're, if you're, okay, while I say that, if your university does not want to apply for it, make sure they release it to you, okay, and do that. So you'll have to figure that out. It's important to get your IP. So for us, we were lucky that SIU wants all our patents. So that was good. So they did do an I provisional IP, and that's what I went in with. The actual patent didn't get filed till last year, I think, I believe. Uh, so that is very important. And then get your data. It has to be tight. It has to be statistically validated. That is very important. Otherwise, your reviewers will throw it out. You, and if you are, you know, um, I'm not going to politics, but if you're a girl, they don't know you. You don't have anybody who's a male in your on your grant. Those things do matter because if they don't know you, they. But you know. Um, Hopefully you'll have enough publications for them to go back and refer back to you. So um, you and get in touch with your program officer before you apply. Tell them this is what I'm going to be applying. That's what I did. I, I just cold called my program officer and I said, hey, uh, this is who I am. These are my publications. And I had just emailed him a slide just like one page of PowerPoint slide saying this is the data I have and I would like to apply for an SBIR. Is this something that NIDCD is interested in funding? And he said, yes, we are. So please go ahead and apply. So um, that was very important. And then pay attention to your commercialization plan, even though for us, for a phase one, it was just like half a page, but I know going into phase two, I'm already having nightmares about a 12 page commercialization plan. So that is important. It is important to know who your vendors are going to be. And you will learn all of that through i -Corps. You know, how to, those different steps that you don't 
we we don't think as we are doing going through our PhDs or you know going through regular school doing our masters and uh, whatever else uh, you're working on and also uh, make sure that you have all your registrations do complete your registrations because come December uh, it does take time so please don't be like me do your registrations if you're in this seminar you are perfect this is perfect time just go ahead and do it it does not cost you anything so um other than that uh, you know and follow what annalisa says please and i just want to give a huge shout out to sherry sherry thanks to you i know oh, she yeah. did that for me so if not for her i wouldn't be here also so thank you sherry soliday so any other uh questions i'm happy to uh answer Great, thank, thank you, Debbie. I, I too am a huge Sherry Soliday fan. Um, and thank you for sharing the tips. Now, now Nina, you have, uh, you know, you had a grant from the biggest granting agency, you know, of the group. Um, it's challenging to get, you know, DOD grants. So, you know, any tips for, for any of the folks here who might want to apply for a DOD grant? Yeah, um, you know, one thing is, I guess for any grant, um, it may seem like, uh, it probably always seems like you don't have enough time to put the proposal together, but just go for it. Because, you know, these grant cycles are every six months. You don't wanna wait for the next cycle, you know, that's, and then you don't hear back from them for another six months, that's a year. So if you find an opportunity that it's a good fit for your company, and you might think that, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to do a good job. There's not enough time. Cause that's always like <laughs> the feeling I get, just go for it. And, you know, I think we can be our, you know, very critical on ourselves and other people will look at it and, you know, actually think that it's great. So I think that just, if you find an opportunity, um, you know, don't, don't, don't think, let me, let me look, let me, let me, you know, I, I don't have enough time now. Just try to go for it. For me, like I'm, you know, I'm not from an, uh, I'm not in academia, so um, it was super helpful to use the resources at Research Park to how, what are they looking for in a proposal? I mean, writing one of these proposals, you, the a level of detail you have to think through. It's almost like you're, you've thought through the bulk of the work at the proposal stage, and I didn't realize that about proposals. I mean, I've learned that now that, you know, just we have to think through that level of detail. I think working with the advisors at Research Park to see what is required and see examples of proposals just was so superbly helpful. And um, and so those would be my two pieces of advice. Great, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Becky, for, for sharing your stories. I mean, you guys are really, it's so fascinating and exciting to, to watch the magic that you guys are doing with your research. And, you know, it seems like all three of you, um, uh, you know, can, can say that probably that it takes a village to put together these applications. And I know that the IUIN was was definitely, you know, part of the village uh, to help you put together the application. So, um, you know, Laura, I, I don't know if you wanted to, um, you know, kind of uh, wrap up with ways that, you know, they might be able to, to reach out to get that assistance that, that help these uh, three talented ladies. That'd be great. Well, you heard two Laura's and Laura Blyle's been involved in i and, and AWARE, which is specifically for women and underrepresented populations uh, that are entrepreneurs. So use some of the resources. We put them in the chat. We do have free assistance for entrepreneurs across Illinois that are pursuing SBIR, SBIR and STTR funding. So please ask us for assistance. As you heard, it's so important. Don't go it alone on that. I heard registrations you can do on your own, but get assistance from somebody like Annalisa or Roland Gartner or some of the other great people, but big cheerleader for Annalisa's work. As you heard, she's really smart in attacking this in a way that has been successful. If you need help with entrepreneurs and residents or i or other types of resources, check out the researchpark.illinois.edu in the resources section, and you'll see many different opportunities for different audiences. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you were as inspired as I was by seeing these wonderful, smart female entrepreneurs and inventors making an impact.